Welcome to Experience Life Today. I'm Ruben E. Goff. It's good to be with you on this Sunday morning. Glad that you tuned in. And I want to say a big hello to all of the brand new viewers and uh, some of you tuning in for the first time. I pray it's going to be a blessing to you. And I also want to welcome back all of you that watch each and every week and those of you that financially support us. I can't thank you enough for supporting us in the financial area because we are 100% viewer supported. And so it is because of your support, we can remain on the air. And I'm very, very thankful for that and appreciate it. May God reward you for doing that. Those of you that are first time viewers, this is a program uh, sometimes going to be right down the middle. And uh, sometimes it's a little bit confrontational. Just want to set it up for you. But let God speak to you and minister to your heart. Don't turn the dial. And give it a one-time go. How's that? I'm just going to try to bait you in and you take a hold of it and see what God has for you. Because he'll meet you wherever. God knows what you need and he'll speak it out through this. I want to also ask all of you that are prayer warriors uh, for this ministry. And many of you, many of you write to us saying, look, we're praying for you. Not only financially support but you're prayerfully supporting us. And I appreciate those prayers. And I'll get to the request in just a minute, but I want to thank you for praying for us. And I want to ask you to do something. There's a lot of things that are taking place, I know, in this ministry and for us throughout this year. And things are happening in a very fast rate. We're not going anywhere. We're not leaving television. We're not leaving the church or anything like that. So uh, let me just set that straight right off the bat. But things are evolving and things are taking place. And I want to ask you to pray because God has really opened doors for us to uh, gain, shall I say, somewhat of an influence in Washington, D.C. God has provided connections uh, in the capital and around that Washington area and people putting us in contact with influential people. And I'll give you an example at this taping. I'm going to be at the Washington, D.C. at the Capitol uh, this, in the middle of the week and uh, going to be there and being a part of something that's taking place on Wednesday night, uh, spending time with uh, at least one uh, United States senator and representative and some other influential people. And this has been ongoing and it's kind of crescendoing. And I'm asking you for prayer because as you know, we're living in a time that is very volatile. Uh, America, uh, the world is very volatile. The, the world is in a very... Uh, a moment of shaking, and I think when you see the news, I don't, I don't even need to go into any more explanation. In America, it is changing as well. In the moral climate is changing. It's different. It's not what it was even 20 years ago. It's certainly not what it was 50 years ago and beyond. Our foundations are shaking. And when you go into Washington, things are different. It's not like it once was. And I, as we go in there, we want to be respectful carriers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We want to go in. I, I may not and others may not go into the Capitol with a, with a Bible and just slinging and beating somebody over the head. And that's not the point. We do go in tactfully and we speak and, and we pray that we speak with wisdom. We pray that we approach things tactfully. We pray that we talking to people that we can speak as God ordains us to speak with the maximum impact to touch hearts and lives of influential people in this nation. And so I'm coming to you very seriously about this and asking you to pray for me and for Lacey and others that are a part and with us that God will use us and but we be willing to be used be, be able to be in those kinds of circumstances and situations without fear, but full of the boldness of God and filled with his wisdom to speak on that level in a very governmental, very diplomatic way and do it all in the name of Jesus, not tarnishing his image, but projecting the accuracy of the kingdom to those people. And so I just want to ask you to pray for us in that. Also having the privilege of being able to travel more and uh, going to different places uh, in the nation and, and soon around the world and speaking on human rights. And uh, they made me the vice president of the Human Rights Global Congress and, and defending people's rights. And uh, around the countries of the world, you'd be a surprise. And how many Christians are dying? Uh, let me give you a statistic. A hundred million Christians have died in the last 10 years. I mean, it's amazing. Uh, the statistics will blow your mind. And there has been more Christians die 
due to martyrdom in the last 100 years than the combined previous 1900 years put together. Now think about that. It is the persecution of Christianity has escalated, has not de-escalated, it has escalated. And it is increasing, and you're seeing it now in Egypt, the Coptic Christians, and in Libya, and in Iraq, and, and, and Syria. I mean, all around the world, you're seeing Christians being killed for simply because they believe in Jesus Christ. And we're attempting to step out and trying to rescue and to push back that and get some dialogue going. Uh, with these countries and nations. Again, needing your prayer for this. It's a very serious time in our history and in our world history, and so we need that, okay? Also, let me put this out to you as well. Uh, as you're sending in your requests, and we're reading them, we're praying over those requests, don't forget also to write in the testimonies. Um, we enjoy the testimonies as well, and we appreciate you trusting us enough to send the prayer requests. We pray over them, believe it in Jesus' name, and then write us back. God answers prayer. Some of you is already doing that. We encourage all of you to do it, and we'll be able to share them. And we do share times here in the audience as well at times during the service, and what God is doing. Lacey sometimes puts some of the requests, not those that are private. We don't violate any of that, but some things we will put in a bulletin in the back of it to let people know, and they'll take it home and pray over it as well, so that you know your confidence is not being broken, but we're praying for those, uh, your situations, those people in your lives, healings, whatever the situation is, okay? So we appreciate that you trust us enough to do that and share in the burden. Also, don't forget to go to the websites as well. And I say websites, you have the Mount Calvary website, you have the Experience Life Today website. Uh, you can go on there and multiple things you can tab away at and, and go. And then there's the YouTube channel on Experience Life Today. You go on to that. When you hit it, it goes to our YouTube channel. And the current message of the week is put up for you. And so if you miss it on Sunday, you only get to get half of it. You go right back and go right to it on that tab. Take it right to the channel and there it'll be. And you can watch the rest of it or watch the entire our program through the week at your own convenience. And those of you that have Direct TV, Direct TV, you have a, a, on your list there, you'll see it, and uh, it, it'll have YouTube. And if you have Direct TV, go on YouTube. You actually watch the program on YouTube on your television. Uh, so some of you have Direct TV. If you didn't know that, it's on there. The YouTube is on there. Punch in my name, whatever experience life today, it'll come up and you can choose what message you want to listen to, okay? Now, Let's take it on a little bit further. I'm a little long-winded today, but we're coming into a message, a message here about lessons from Bethesda. And uh, you're going to really, I believe, really be encouraged by this and what God was speaking to us on that day. Uh, some of you are coming also to the church here in visitation. Hey, we want to encourage you. We want to encourage you. If you want to come and visit, I know it's a long way in four states here. Uh, we have some folks have traveled in, coming in, you know, just to stop by and visit. We, we want you to come. Uh, if We understand some of you down in West Virginia. Uh, we have some people that every now and then will come from Cumberland, Maryland. And that takes a while to get here from there. I think it is about an hour and 20 minutes maybe. I don't know. if Somewhere in that area, I don't know what it is, okay? But it's a little distant. But they'll come and visit with us. Uh, some areas of West Virginia, I know it's a little distant for you. Some down in Northern Virginia, that's a little distance. Uh, but anytime you want to come, Sunday morning at 10 a.m., we're situated, and we call it Cornfield County, but it's really not. It's Franklin County, Pennsylvania, but we carry on. It's Cornfield because we sit out in the middle of Cornfield. It's a little community, uh, but you can GPS it, the address, and find out here. We have directions on the website at the church. You can find right how to get in here. It's not that hard to find it, and, but if you have any questions, don't hesitate to call. Don't hesitate to get in contact with us. We'll help you get in here, and uh, if you have a uh, helicopter, uh, we'll help you get in. In. If you got an airplane, you can land in a cornfield. Now, you can't beat that. I'm just kidding with you. I'm just teasing. Uh, but there is an airport down in Hagerstown. Maybe you can come in. I don't know. We'll come down the church van and pick you up. All right. Well, you know, it's almost time here. We're going to get into this. So thank you again for your support. Get ready for this. Lessons from Bethesda. Thank you again for your mail coming in. Thank you for your support. Don't forget to continue to pray for us. And we do pray for you. And we pray for all 
of our viewers and we pray for you that send in the requests. We know that God is moving on your behalf in Jesus' name. So here we go. Are you ready for this program to start? It's getting ready. Cinch your shoes. Get that last cup of coffee because here it is. We don't have any more time. We're out of time. So ready? Here we go. Five, four, three, two, one. We're going to Lessons in Bethesda. Are you ready for the word? Amen. 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 I want you to turn in the book of Mark this morning. Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8. No, I, I know by Mark chapter 8, you can tell we're not at the beginning of one of the books, and primarily it would be Matthew or Luke if I was on a Christmas story, and unfortunately I, I'm not, I say that in my own way, I, I'm not discrediting the Holy Spirit in what He leads us to do. I, I just simply do not have a Christmas story message this morning, uh, but... Anything that you speak on about Jesus Christ is a Christmas story because everything he does, how about Brother Sam, everything that he does is a gift to humanity and in everything that he did or does, he basically not just demonstrating his power, he is giving of himself to humanity as he did in that manger. So when we're looking here in Mark chapter 8 and specifically I was going to begin in verse 22, and then I was going to go down to verse 26, and you're dealing with the story of a blind man in Bethsaida. However, when I was looking at this and reading and uh, studying and looking at the nuggets that was contained in these verses, I begin to realize the, the theological or hermeneutical law that you uh, contextualize everything that you read. You make sure that, what does that mean? Simply is to make sure that you don't extract something out of context. If, in other words, you don't take a verse, take it out of the Bible, and make it mean anything you want it to mean. Uh, when Jesus speaks or anything, the Holy Spirit inspires in the Bible. You always read the verses before and after to get the thread and the thought and the flow to understand specifically what God is targeting or the individual is targeting at that moment. And that way we, can, we keep ourselves out of these theological terms that are souped up. I'll explain them. Instead of being a proper exegete, you become an eisegete. All that simply means is improper interpretation. It simply means that you pervert it and making it say what you want to say or what I wanted to say instead of what God truly intended. And how many knows it's always good when you know people take what you say in the way that you meant it to be taken, right? Uh, sometimes people take it the wrong way. You didn't intend it that way. Well, the God, our God is the same way. He does not want people to take things the wrong way. So when I came into verse 22 and read this story, I, I got into the habit of categorizing. I got into the habit of, of taking it and making it an exclusive event, taken out of Scripture, kept it in its uh, category, uh, kept it in its own little context, and wouldn't break out of that and go before and after. Until I began to study and read the verses before in verses 14 on, and I realized that Jesus was continuing the teaching to the disciples even when he was on his way to Bethsaida. And realizing that without the prior verses, Bethsaida does not carry the depth and meaning and the impact that Jesus meant it to take. Now I want you to look at this this morning as more than, as great, as grandiose as it is, the healing and the physical demonstration of God's power, his compassion on, on a human race that physically deals with a lot of maladies and diseases and problems. However, always look beyond at times where Jesus is trying to convey even into a spiritual sense and parallel that what's happening physically, he's also dealing with the heart. Can you say amen to this if you're with me? Now, this, let's see how he sets this up in verse 14 and I'll read and I'll have you come on in a moment. And I'm reading out of the King James, but in whatever version you have, we'll arrive at the same spot. Now the disciples had forgotten to take bread. Neither had they in the ship with them more than one loaf. This is chapter 8, verse 14, now 15. And he charged them, saying, Take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the leaven of Herod. Now we understand that when he speaks of the leaven of the Pharisees, leaven of Herod, he's not talking about bread in its physical sense. 
He's talking about leaven or the perverted doctrines of these religious sects or political sects, which was the Herodians in this instant. And they reasoned, they is the disciples, and they reasoned among themselves, it is because we have no bread. They totally did not comprehend, misunderstood, mistook what Jesus just said and improperly applied it to the physical when he was talking about the spiritual. And when Jesus knew it, he saith unto them, why reason ye? Because you have no bread. Perceive ye not yet, neither understand. Have you your heart yet hardened? Now listen to this. Having eyes, see ye not. Having ears, hear ye not. And do you not remember? When I break the five loaves among five thousand, how many baskets full of fragments took ye up? They say unto him, Twelve. And when the seven among four thousand, how many baskets full of fragments took ye up? And they said, seven. And he said unto them, how is it that you do not understand? This, that, that's powerful. He is talking to them about their, they have physical eyes, but yet the eyes of their understanding is not comprehending the spiritual ramifications and the teaching and the depth that Jesus is trying to bring into their insight. And then he says, you have ears, you have physical ears. There's nothing, pro nothing wrong or a problem with uh, your ability to hear somebody conversing with you or talking or hearing a sound or, or hearing something or the rustling uh, of leaves with the wind blowing. There's nothing. But he said, you're having a problem hearing or ingesting the words that I'm speaking to you. You are not comprehending the, what is being given or imbued uh, to your life. And then... Then, listen to this in verse 22, and I'll, I'll refer back to this in just a little while. But in verse 22, and he cometh to Bethsaida. And I thought, well, he just left off teaching. Let's forget about it. Now we're going into Bethsaida, and I'll explain all about this city in just a moment, but let's just let the text speak to us. And he cometh to Bethsaida, and they bring a blind man unto him and besought him to touch him. And he took the blind man, <laughs> And by the hand and led him out of the town. There are so many questions with this story that's going to come to our own life in a moment. And when he spit on his eyes, number one is why lead him out of the town? Why not do it there? Then spit on his eyes. Why do that? And put his hands upon him and ask him if he saw a lot. And then you start asking the question. He asked if he could see anything. Do you mean Jesus didn't know he couldn't see anything? Was he really asking a question that he didn't know or was he asking him for some other reason? All of these things when you're reading the Bible, there's nothing wrong with asking questions. God is more than happy to answer them. Can you say amen? And he looked up and said, the blind man, I, I see men as trees walking. After that, he put his hands again upon his eyes and made him look up and he was restored and saw every man clearly. And he sent him away to his house, saying, Neither go into the town, nor tell it to any in the town. Now, as we get into this story, remembering the blind and Jesus coming into this earth, as we kind of referencing in a Christmas season, but, but, but referencing that Jesus came into this world to restore the sight to the blind. And Luke talks about that in chapter 4 as well. You'll take notice that when Jesus, through his journeys of healing, it is interesting to me that the blind, now he healed the paralytic, he healed the cripples obviously, he healed the mute, he healed the deaf, but there seems to be a concentration many times on the blind. It does seem like that uh, many of his miracles, he uh, had interaction with those who were blind. The two and Bartimaeus, and you remember all of these stories, and there's several accounts throughout the four Gospels dealing with, or three of them actually, and dealing with the blind. And I don't think it was by accident that he just simply had some sort of uh, wanting to gravitate towards those that were blind because he liked them more than somebody else. I, I believe that there was something more important about about relating to the human race the perils of blindness, not only to the physical eye, but also to the spiritual eye. And, and when you come to the blindness and those who were blind in that day, 
any disease, as we've learned here, that, that they would gather together almost in little miniature colonies within civilizations and within communities and towns and cities and they would, they would hang out together. They, they may be an infirmary together or they may be in a section of the place together. And rarely was there any uh, social intercourse with these individuals. Rarely other than somehow to dispense some food from their families, this, that, and the other. Uh, some sort of provision of shelter. But by and large, they were a neglected part of society. And so forbid if you had a malady or disease, you literally did become more of an outcast and a social drain to the rest of the community in their eyes. Thank God for people that have compassion. Amen. <laughs> I mean, it's terrible to be ostracized for things that is, is, is acquainted to all of the human race and things that you can't help, amen? And so it's good when people can lend out a hand. Thank God for a church who loves one another, amen? But in the world, that is not the case. And many times throughout civilizations, throughout the time, this was the case that they did not take care of them. And one reason was they didn't have a cure. They didn't have something to take care of them. But people like being around. And you say, why does the blind, why does the deaf, why? And we've learned before that it is interesting that people that share the same problems, a lot of times sharing the same misery. We've all heard this, the, the adage that misery loves company. And that is true. Amen. Uh, if you find one miserable person on the job, they will find somebody else who is about as miserable as they are. Right? And they just seem to feed off of that. And it is true that uh, even in this time, blind uh, was kind of put together and, and people kind of generally like to hang out with the same kind of people who share the same problems, who share the same pain, may share the same misery, share the same vision in life, same outlook in life. And so you see people all, you can put them in a room of a thousand people and they'll start to migrate and, and integrate and, and find one another. And the next thing you know, you have little factions and pockets and generally when you walk into that little section now after a couple weeks, you'll find they, they share something in a commonality together. And, and so you begin to see that even in the world. And all of these communities existed because there were no medical cures. Nobody had a cure for blindness. Nobody had a cure for deafness. Nobody had a cure for some sort of uh, crippled or nerve disease or nerve problem or uh, uh, any of these things. They, they didn't have anything like that and so they didn't know what to do with them. And, and so so naturally in a fallen condition, they ostracized them and, and just put them out and just hope for the best for them. But you know, in that kind of an environment of hopelessness, of misery, of darkness, and, and, and no vision, and, and no life, and just waking up every day with no hope, anything will change. Nothing's going to change. I'm, I'm going to wake up and I'll go to sleep tonight and, and nothing. I'm, I, I wake up a beggar. I'm going to sleep as a beggar. I wake up blind. I'm going to bed blind. I wake up as a cripple. I'm going uh, to bed as a cripple. But in the middle of this, get this picture, in the middle of this misery walks God's pharmacist, walks right into the middle, the epitome of life and the one who has the cure for all human disease. Now, that ought to light somebody's fire today. Amen. That, that at that moment in that blindness or, or deafness or whatever the case, and all of a sudden in walks God's only begotten son who does not have to rely on human invention, ingenuity, science, anything, doesn't have to wait on a cure. He is the cure. And if you can get him in the midst of that, honey, everything will be all right. That's why I always say it's always good to come to church because when you, come, when you have Jesus in the midst, everything will be all right. <laughs> You say, why do you say that? Because in church, he said, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. That's why it's so important. Get people in the presence of God because in the presence of God, there is what? Fullness of joy. Come on now. You say, well, I've been to church already and there wasn't any joy. Probably Jesus wasn't there. No, wait a minute. You say, no, wait, you just said where two or three are gathered. No, I didn't, finish. I didn't finish there. It says where two or three are gathered together in my name. You can gather together and have a church label over the door and Jesus, because we're not gathering together in his name, too many people are gathering together in their own name or in their denomination's name and they forget about Jesus. Jesus promised I'll be there if you gather in my name. What does in my name mean? Under my authority. Woo. 
Woo, glory to God. I'm telling you, when Jesus shows up, things are going to change. And so in the middle of this misery, here comes, <laughs> there comes a doctor. You, you, if somebody gets sick, even on an airplane, the first thing they do is, is there a doctor in the house? Well, guess what? There came a doctor in the house in this story. Amen. <laughs> Glory to God. You see, it, now, now we got to think a little bit more. Let's take it a little bit deeper here today and just think and, and let it play out. But if Jesus came and boy, he healed people. Wow. I mean, he healed people from the beginning of his ministry all the way. Uh, practically to the very end. He healed uh, people. But Jesus didn't just come to heal people's bodies. <laughs> and I'll tell you, he could have spent his entire lifetime healing sick bodies and never made a dent to disease or in disease or against that problem in humanity. He could have spent every waking hour healing the sick and never made a dent in the disease that was perpetuated all across this fallen humanity. He, there was a reason why he did it, but, but, but he didn't just come to heal the body or people. I will tell you why he did heal people. Why did Jesus heal people? I'll tell you why. And I wrote this down. To demonstrate the kingdom of heaven's superiority over that which sin had produced. Jesus Christ, when he healed a person, what did he do? He made them a billboard and a sign stuck up along the highway of life for people to look at and to literally and, and clearly see this is the demonstration of God's power and superiority over everything sin produced. I've got power over that. Amen. I'll tell you what, I like a billboard like that. That beats McDonald's Big Mac in three miles any day, amen? Uh, <laughs> I, I, I'd rather see a sign that says, I was once sick, but now I'm healed. I, I would like to see a sign, I was once blind, but now I see. I'd like to see a billboard along the highway of life saying, look, I was once in sin, addicted, but now what? I have been made free, and now I'm living large for the Lord, amen? That's what this world needs is to see the billboard stuck up, lights on it and, and shining on it in the midnight hour. And listen, when people are driving down the highway of life and they're in misery, they have no hope. But if they can see that light up on the hill, they can see that billboard lit up. It creates desire just like that. When it puts food up, you're hungry going down there, boy, I'm hungry. And all of a sudden there's a billboard that says, well, five mile ahead is a place you can get something to eat. And a big green, I, if you're a vegetarian, I'm sorry. Sorry, you can write me later. I've already received letters like that, but I'm going to say it anyway. And, and I, I, boy, just grease, grease run now. What do we call that the other night? It's not really grease. It's, I forget what it was now, dripping protein. I don't know what it was. Somebody had a better word for it, but it was dripping grease. And I mean, you're, you're, oh, I could eat that. Oh, I could eat that. Do you know we ought to be like that sign? Our life should so reflect Christ that it creates hunger in people's lives. And they say, you know what? I want what they got. Oh, I'd like to live like that. Whew. In the throes of my own sin, I can testify to that. And we went up to my brothers at one point, and, and I don't know if she remembers this or not, we went up, and they went out to a pond, and, and there, it was a youth group or something. And I'll never forget, in the throes of sin, and I remember seeing my, my brother, I remember seeing some of his church members, and I didn't say a word. I was in the throes of sin. I mean in the throes and the depths of it. And I remember looking at them and thinking in my heart, I wish I was like that. Think about that. Think about that. That's what people should be looking at all of us today. I wish I was like that. And guess what? You can tell them, well, you can be like that. Amen. Honey, none of us was born this way. Amen. Pastor, you wasn't? Oh, no. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm just, I'm just picking on you. Why did he heal them? The people became living billboards to God's life and power, but, but healing is Hear this, and I don't want this taken wrong in any, uh, with any perception. I want you to hear this. Healing, the body is dealing with the symptom. And so Christ's coming had more to accomplish than just healing bodies and raising the dead. It was about reaching ultimately the sin-sick soul. Think, never forget this, his mission is wonderful of healing sick bodies, raising the dead, doing these great exploits on the outside. This is dealing with the symptoms. 
But what his ultimate goal was, I'm going to deal with the sin-sick soul. Don't Everything I do is geared at reaching inside the life of an individual. <laughs> How many knows what I'm saying? Now, when you look at this, when he healed the blind in this story as well, when he healed the blind, he would use it to teach about the peril of a blind heart. Remember now, he had just spoke to his disciples and chastised them that even though he had spent all this time, they're not hearing him, they're not seeing, they're not perceiving things. Their heart is beginning to grow hard. It's becoming insulated in its perception against what God is trying to share with them. And so he leads them to Bethsaida to teach an object lesson to them from the outside indicating their condition that's becoming like this on the inside. And so with that, he healed this and he's teaching about the perils of a blind heart. Jesus is showing us the danger of being blind, not so much on the outside, which it is, but he's showing us the danger of being blind on the inside. And I don't know if you know this or not, but the whole world without Christ is blind. We were blind before Christ. And I have... Here's some other things that hit to mind. There are more people blind on the inside than there are on the outside, physically speaking. And you say, what do you mean by that? Because over the years, when I, when I contemplate, when I reflect back over years of ministry and so forth, and I don't say any of this condescendingly, I'm using this as an example. You'd be surprised how blind we can become on the inside to the very things we do that brings destruction to our own life and don't see it. So what do you mean by that? All right, give me a sentence. I know people, I mean, I have known people personally who, who love, who crave, who want attention and love and want others to love them but they themselves do things to drive people away and they don't see what they do that drives people away. Are you catching this? I've known people, like they want attention, they want people to love them. There's nothing wrong with desiring people to love you, but, but uh, they want that relationship. They, they want, but every relationship they get into, they do things that destroy the relationship. And then when you tell them, look, this is something you're doing that's causing a wedge. It's something you need to correct in your life. They don't see it. And if they don't uh, become humble and accept it, they will refuse to see it because pride has a way of don't find fault with myself. <laughs> Are you hearing me? It takes humility to look in the mirror of our own lives instead of looking in the mirror of everybody else's life. I know we love being inspectors of other people's lives, but if we start inspecting ourselves, it will lower the critical attitude of others. Because then we start seeing we're not probably what we might have thought we were. Boy, it's getting quieter and quieter. I hear in this little Presbyterian gathering this morning. Amen. You see, now, now, now let's, let's continue with that. There, there's others. I mean, when you think about it, there are people, they want to succeed in life. They have great goals, great visions, but, but the things they do to themselves, it keeps them down. It keeps them from prospering. And, and the things that they're doing is keeping them from that success, but they're blind to it. They don't see that. I'm going to say something, and, I, and I'm so, boy, and as I was writing this, and I was thinking uh, so wonderfully of, of, of our parents here in this, in this church, and I mean, I, I was just thinking about this yesterday afternoon or Friday afternoon, and I, uh, just looking around, I think you as a people agree, raising uh, young children in this church, I, I, I just want to applaud all of these young parents that, that invest in their children. Amen? I, I tell you, they, they, there's not, I wish there was a whole lot more doing this thing. But you know, much in the world, and this is what I'm targeting, but, but parents, and I've seen this, parents will destroy their children. Destroy their children. Don't mean to. Don't want to. That's not their goal but will destroy their children and then later cry and complain how bad they are and yet don't see the things they as a parent have done to cause and to create the problem with the child. 
And how many times you see that and think, my goodness, they're destroying the child. And then they cry and they complain and they weep. And I, why, did, why is my child acting like this? And, and the very things they're doing is creating it or has created this. And we have to reflect back on ourselves. It's called blindness, not here, but on the inside. Do you, you know, I've known people over the years, they, they cause problems repeatedly in their marriages. They don't want the problem. They're not, they're not, they're not setting out, waking up in the morning thinking, well, I'll tell you what I think. I'm just going to see how bad I'm going to make it for my spouse today. <laughs> well, some in here might think that. But anyway, uh, <laughs> Lacey has thought that a time. But really, I haven't. But, but you see, <laughs> we caught it. But, but you know, but for the most part, <laughs> for the, Nancy's really staring at Bill. I think there's something wrong. But you see, <laughs> no, nah, I'm just picking. I'm just picking. But you really, but, but when you look at this, uh, they don't really, seriously, they, people don't really set out to cause problems in their marriage. They don't, they don't really look out to ruin the day or the week or the year of their spouse. But, but many times they don't have a clue what they're, that they're doing something themselves to cause it. And so I think I'm making the point, and not to belabor it anymore, that there is a lot of blindness on the inside that's creating a lot of misery on the outside. Amen? And so when we look at this, it's easy to blame everything in our life on outside, external circumstances uh, than it is as a result of our own inner turmoil and confusion as a result of our own blindness. And so we have to become humble enough to say, maybe the problem isn't somebody out there. Maybe it's me. Maybe I need to do a personal inventory. Amen? And so it's easy. I mean, you hear that today. It's a mantra in our society that, well, it's the way mom and dad raised me. <laughs> it's their fault. You know, once you reach adulthood, you have to assume your own responsibility. Uh, you know, it, well, it's, it's because of what so-and-so said and did, and they did this and they did that. And, and, and let me tell you something. Uh, as, as hard and painful as many life experiences are, and does and can leave scars in the human heart, but there is an answer to that. When we come to Christ, we have to forgive and let it go. Amen? That is a commandment. That's not, a, that's not an option. <laughs> you say, well, that, what they did wasn't right. Maybe it wasn't right and probably wasn't. But let God be the judge. Live free from it. Amen. Don't let them control your life. You walk away and you know I've been absolved. I forgive them and they're not keeping me awake at night one more night longer. Amen? And so in Ephesians 1.18, you don't have to turn here because I, I got to get into this story and we're going to dissect this in just a moment. But in Ephesians 1.18, it's interesting. Paul prayed for the Ephesian church. One thing he prayed for them. He didn't pray about uh, anything else other than this. He said, I pray that the eyes of your understanding be enlightened. Well, that's incredible. He said, I pray that your inner eye can see, you can perceive the things of God. Because he goes on to say that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. And he continues on in, in this discourse. And I mean, it's beautiful. He said, my, my prayer is that you be able to see on the inside the goodness of God, the riches of God, his glory and everything he is proportioned for your life. That's what I pray is that you can see why. That's the most important thing. If you can get a Christian Christian, to see that, honey, you've got yourself a firebrand on your hands. Amen? For the Lord Jesus Christ. It's all about seeing. Now, Now, let's return to the story and let's get into this. We set the premise. But when you look here again, it says Bethsaida in the verse, verse that we dealt with in verse 22. And he cometh to Bethsaida. And they bring a blind man unto him and besought him to touch him. And it's interesting that Bethsaida, let's get a little background. Bethsaida, what kind of a place is this? As we learned here in the church before and learning our little uh, terms and so forth, and you remember that the word Beth, this is, these words are what we call transliterations. What is transliterations? It is taking the word out of the original language, whether it's Hebrew, Greek, or maybe it is Aramaic, whatever the case, whatever is adaptable there, and they take it out of the original language and put your own alphabetical letters to it. You don't change it. You just leave it as it is. The word Beth before any word means house. So anytime, just like now, Bethlehem, as we've learned, Bethlehem, Beth means house, and Hem means bread. So you have the house of bread. How fitting it is Jesus was born in the house of bread because he is the bread of life. It is intricately woven fabric here uh, with God's purposes all through even these words. When you get other words, Bethsaida and, and, and Bethesda, what is Bethesda? 
Bethesda. Bethesda is Beth, house, uh, the rest of that word simply means uh, mercy or infirmary. And so basically they will translate, it means house of mercy. Now when you get to this word, Bethsaida, what is that? It's also a house. And Saida is actually the word for fish. So it is the house of fish. And you say, why? Because this, this particular city, uh, uh, town, was actually located in the northeastern side or quadrant of the Sea of Galilee. It is a port city. It is a city uh, where fishermen, uh, uh, fish uh, uh, processing was done. All of that was done. Very hard place to live. Uh, in this uh, area, it was known as a rough city, very rough, a uh, little less than blue collar, uh, nothing against blue collar, but it, it was, it was I, I'm, trying to, I'm laboring to put into words to get you to get an accurate picture. These men that worked in these fishing industry were, were men that were not icons of society. They, they were men who lived a very low life, okay? The atmosphere and society of Beth uh, Bethsaida was very wicked, okay? It was very rough. It was not a safe place to live. You would not have taken your children there and said, oh, I just, I'm just dreaming. Where's your vacation spot? Or oh, where would you like to retire? The last place on the list would have been Bethsaida. You would not have wanted to go to this area. Now, knowing that, also in that area, women hung around these areas of the lower baser sort. And as you can imagine in your minds, I don't mean to drum, uh, drum up all of that imagery, but I'm getting you to see what kind of a society Bethsaida was. A very rough place. But what is good is in that verse, if you look over there again, it says, and they bring a blind, they, the word they, they are not told, we're not told who they are. It just simply is there's more than one, they bring the blind man out of Bethsaida. They evidently live there. And, and this, this story really blesses my heart because they, no one cares in this fishing business, all of these men, these women, no one cares for these blind, halt, maimed, the crippled, the deaf, the mute. Nobody cares why. In this city, the people are busy. They work from the crack of dawn to the time the sun sets. That is their, that is their work day. It's about a 12-hour day. They, they work hard and they are busy and they're too busy to care about anybody or anything else. But isn't it wonderful? This is the power of the gospel. Somebody just told me this recently, that, that God has people everywhere. <laughs> Are you hearing me? You'd be surprised where God has people positioned and you walk into it. Isn't it beautiful that in the midst of all of this, all of this society of Bethsaida, there is a they. There are a people who love, who care, who probably is serving Christ, who is living and thriving and care enough for another person to bring them out of this cesspool and bring them to Jesus. Jesus. Boy, I tell you, we need that today in America. We need the Christians of America, the church people of America. We need to care enough. Let's bring them to Jesus. Amen. We can live in this environment. I know that politically, I know that socially, we are becoming the modern day outcasts as they were physically then. We are becoming the outcasts today. Politically, they don't want to hear your voice. Socially, they don't want to give you a voice. Hollywood wants to ignore your voice. But however, let all of the negativity come that may in our finest hour, this can be our finest hour because the more dark it becomes, that means greater the light is going to shine in and through our lives. So don't get through this season and being negative. Let's look up. Our redemption is coming soon, but until he comes, let's shine the light of Jesus wherever we are. If they could do it in Bethsaida, then we can do it in the United States of America. You see, let me ask you another question. They come to the blind man. <laughs> they say, sir, we're taking you to Jesus. What if the blind man would have said, I'm not going down there. <laughs> Nothing ever changes. This is the power of an attitude, isn't it? I am not going down there. Who do you think uh, you are? I'm not doing that. I, listen, I've been waking up for 30 years and been blind, going to sleep. Same thing, nothing ever changes and, and being the grump of the city. I'm not doing that. And you know, if his attitude would have been like that, he could have resisted and Jesus does not overcome somebody's will. <laughs> he could have took himself out of that miracle. 
But thank God he didn't. <laughs> Jesus, when he walks into Bethsaida, so it's very careful of our attitude. Jesus just walks into Bethsaida and as soon as they bring him a blind man, here's what's interesting as we read that story. Jesus just arrives at the port. He walks into the city. <laughs> no sooner does he get in there, listen to this, no sooner than he gets in there, they bring him the blind man upon hearing of his arrival. As soon as the blind man is coming, he's walking, they're walking, they have meet at the intersection and, and they say, look, we want him blind, touch him, do something and heal this man. Immediately Jesus turns. He just arrived in the city and he immediately turns, takes the blind man and they walk back out of the city. Now there's some things that really dropped into my heart because when we read this, he saw men as trees. This tells me that the blind man, how did he know what a man looked like and how did he know what a tree looked like? <laughs> Evidently, this man was not blind all of his life. Evidently, at some point, as I pointed out, I said, wait a minute, the Holy Spirit hit me yesterday and said, look at that, look at that verse. If he saw men as trees, how did he know what a man looked like? How did he know what a tree looked like? Because at one time in his life, he could see. Now you're starting to get this. <laughs> this is not the man blind from birth. This is a different story. This man saw men as trees. He could identify both of them and he realized that a man, what a man looked like because he realized that it's not right that a man should look like a tree. <laughs> and he realized that a tree should not look like a man. He could, he could differentiate between the two. So this man could see at one time and possibly very clearly at one time, but something interrupted his vision. Something took it away. Something changed the way that he could see. And you know, then you have to wonder, was it or is it possible that Bethsaida, the wicked place, the dark place that it was, that maybe his environment was contributing to his despair and to the reason for his blindness in the first place? Was it possible? I don't know this, but it's possible, isn't it, that his own environment contributed to the problem he was experiencing and had experience him. And then I wrote in my notes says, just two words, is yours. <laughs> you have to be careful of the environment that you are living in. You have to be careful of the environment you exist in. You have to be careful of the environment you feel comfortable in because every time that we live in an environment, we are giving that environment opportunity and ability to influence our thinking and way of life and, and, and literally can change our thinking and can take our sight into blindness. Are you here? We have to be careful of the environments. This is why you don't want to be unequally yoked to an unbeliever. That's why you have to be careful of associations of how close and intimate they become. Because the more intimate something becomes, the more open they become in influencing one another. So we have to be very careful of that environment. You see, he knew what trees look like. He must have seen them before, but possibly his environment caused it. He saw people. He did see people after the first touch, after this first spitting. He, I'll get to that in just a moment. But, but he saw people, but he didn't see them clearly. He didn't see them the way they really are. I'll tell you something. We really need to see people the way they really are. <laughs> I hope this speaks to you this morning. We really do. You know, when you first meet a person, really that's not really how they are. People like to project who they're not. <laughs> but the more you hang around them, the more you see who they really are. <laughs> <laughs> and don't ignore the signs. That's what I wrote in that book, Avoiding Relationship Mayhem. That's why I put that in there. I mean, the Lord was dropping that. So even as I was writing that, that, that <laughs> many times, even in marriages, later so, boy, I tell you, I don't know why we're in such a mess. The reason why the mess is there, signs were ignored along the way. People do demonstrate who they are. We just ignore them. We don't see them. Amen. This is why I tell our young people, we pick and carry on with each other. And, and, but, this, you know, that's why I say, uh, oh, of course, when, you, when you're with somebody, you certainly want them to be good looking, right? I mean, nobody goes out as a teenager or 20 years old or 25, and they don't go out and say, you know what, I think I'm just going to find the ugliest person I can find. And just, you know, they have to have an appeal. Am I right? They have to, right, they have to have an appeal uh, to the sight. But always keep in the back of the mind, the person you're marrying is way deeper than what you see. 
their character. <laughs> huh? See that? <laughs> he just he didn't always like to go, just keep that in mind. You see, he saw people, but he didn't see them the way they really were. The, the, notice something else that the trees and the people that he was looking at didn't change. But after he was healed, he's the one that changed, not them. Are you getting this? The people, he didn't see them right. He saw them as trees, walking. I, this, this really tends to my mind. He, when, when, when Jesus retouches him, uh, nothing else changed. The circumstances, that, none of that changed. What changed was the individual. Many times, it is us who really does need to change. It's really our perception is perverted because we need to change on the inside. It's not so much they're the problem, maybe I am. Thank you for no amens on that. Now, let's, let's look a little bit further. Sometimes we pray for God to change others, but it's us who need to change. You know, that blind man could have been out saying a Christian, he could have been walking all around and saying, God, change this person, change this person. And, and yet, he was the one that needed to be changed. Some people, and then when he gets healed the first time, or semi, he's not completely healed. And one thing for sure going through life, some people are satisfied with half, but it's not complete and whole. I don't know about you, but I don't want to ever become satisfied with half. I want to be whole. <laughs> I, listen, God has promised you everything. Why not take it? Why not live half? Why not live whole? Why put up with half? Amen? Who wants to have? Why deal with a half empty glass when you can have it running over and, and, and flowing into your life? Amen? So, so don't, don't put up with that half. You see, Bethsaida here is a cursed city because Jesus has pronounced woe over their city prior to this. He said, woe unto you, Bethsaida. Because of the things that would have been done in Sodom and Gomorrah and other cities that's been done in you, they would have repented a long time ago. He said what happened was they rejected, Bethsaida had rejected the power of God and his disciples. And three, it's interesting that, that Peter, Andrew, and Philip, three of the apostles actually were from Bethsaida. Three of them actually was born and raised there. Now notice this, but they didn't stay there. There are places you cannot stay in. And they left that city and went with Jesus. There are some areas you've got to get up and walk out of and move yourself away from that environment. Are you with me? And so they, you can't stay there. And, and you've got to leave. And that's another reason. He brings the blind man out. Yes, there's a woe over the city. But I'll tell you as well, if that environment was created, he brought that blind man out as well. And, and literally showing him, there are sometimes you've got to get up and move out of that environment for the time being until there comes a healing in your life that you're strong enough to deal with certain things in your life. Amen? And people. And then what comes to me, and I'm just throwing these things out. Look at the story in it. In it's in its round nature here and coming from all sides. But isn't it interesting? He spit on him. I, now, I can never figure that out. Spit on the man. Has any of you ever been spit on? <laughs> yeah, some of you might have. And, and, and know that when somebody spits on you, it wasn't to heal you, was it? Huh? They, people don't spit on somebody to heal you. It's why do they spit on you? They're mad. It is a sign of utter disdain and disgust and hatred for you. That's what it is when they spit on you. I mean, it's a terrible experience. And, but, but isn't it interesting? And, I, and again, just, just, just give me this freedom to explore this. But Jesus spits in the man's eye. And I think to myself, why spit in a guy's eye? He didn't tell him to go wash in the pool of Siloam. That was another story and another reason. Why spit right in a guy's eye? And you know, it's interesting that, that Jesus is probably saying at this point that, that my spit, my spit is better than all of the wealth of Bethsaida. I mean, Jesus could have vomited, threw up, for lack of better, puked on the man. I mean, he could have threw up on the guy and it would have been better than all of what Bethsaida had to offer. Will you say, what verse do you have for that? Because God's garbage is better than all of the treasures of this world. Because 
Apostles Paul said the foolishness of God is better than the wisdom of men. Isn't that something? Even the weakness of God is more powerful than the most powerful things of man. God's trash is better to be ate than the things of the best of this world. Can you say amen? I, I just, if you think about that, he spit on the guy's eye, basically saying, look, the worst that I would have to offer is better than all that Bethsaida has to offer your life. Boy, I tell you, I just want to shout amen to that. The worst God has is better than anything this world has ever dreamed of. And I'll tell you that too many people are trying to have this godly experience while simultaneously trying to feed in a worldly environment. Success in God means that we have to come out of that environment and be ye separate. The Bible says, Paul said it as well to the Corinthian church. He said, you, you've got to come, come yourselves. He said, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. And God said, and then I will receive you. He's not talking about going and living in a monastery. He's not saying create a little community subculture of Christianity and live in the side corner of a city or a town. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking on the inside. You come out of that environment of sin. You become recreated on the inside. And wherever you go, you are not that environment of the world. You're a totally remade environment by Jesus Christ representing the kingdom of God. Can you say amen? That's why Jesus, when he walked into the most heinous areas of civilization. When he walked into Bethsaida or anywhere else he would go, when he walked in, he'd make the announcement, the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven has come nigh you. <laughs> oh, I tell you what, there's nothing better than living for the Lord in this time. Amen? I mean, it's just like, listen, just dabbing me with a church service at the end of the week, I know we know this is the first day of the week, but most of the world says uh, it's the end of the week, but just dabbing me with a church service at the end of the week does not heal me if I'm refusing to leave the environment that is corrupting my soul. I'm going to say that one more. I, I want you to hear this. Just dabbing myself with a church service at the end of the week does not heal my life if I'm refusing to leave the environment that is corrupting my soul. There's more, let me tell you something, there's more to church and more to Christianity than just saying, I go to church. It's being the church. It's when we leave, we don't lose what we just gained in here. I thought about preaching on this. I mean, there's things coming for tonight. But you, you just, you know, we, we work. Listen, it, it, church, Christianity is not just about gathering people in here. And boy, it's, it's wonderful. We should do this. Gathering people and bringing people in, yes. But do you know, we're still the church when we go out there. We can go out there and touch their lives. We can go out there and lay hands on their bodies. We can go out there and see healings, manifestations, and lead people to Christ out there. Why? We are the body of Christ. Amen? Glory to God. Aren't you glad you came to church on Sunday morning? Yeah. Not really. Come tonight. <laughs> and if you really hate it, come this Wednesday night. Some of you get that tomorrow morning. <clears throat> Praise God. Did you learn something this morning? Amen. Let's stand this morning. I, I want us to, I want to really pray over us here this morning.